Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 356. I'm your host, Lauren Gray, and to everyone that's joining us globally as they do, thank you so much for taking the time, even in your disparagingly different time zones, to join us live and either watch us on our simulcast on social media, which is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, multiple pages on all of them except for LinkedIn, which has uh, just one opportunity for us to broadcast, which is under Lauren Gray, my LinkedIn identity and then of course always on our tv station tv channel network it's like a hodgepodge of different terms between the channel and network or station in which way it's hospitality channel uh you can find it on your apple ios and also android under either just look for the app uh hospitality channel but if you're more importantly on your tv you can look at us on your roku google uh apple or amazon and find us on any of that. Just look for the channel, Hospitality Channel. And this live show is always broadcast free on that side. Oh, and one that I did miss, Twitch. We want to make sure we're available for all those that use their gaming console for um, broadcast access uh, for the rich media. And so we created a Twitch channel as well that we simulcast on. So now we've identified all the places we are showing up. Let's make it valuable for you to have joined up and joined up with us. Uh, our topic today has come out of a persistent dialogue based on where we are here first in the United States and, of course, Europe. And to some degree, the Asian community has this same flux. Um, and that is summertime. Summertime is always a time that is uh, predominantly larger in traffic volume for what we know statistically is based on the history. And I'm going to refer more to the U.S. travel culture than I am for international travel culture, and I apologize, but I have the data for this more accurately than I have in other markets. Um, the U.S., we tend to travel twice per year uh, on average. Always there's means difference and, of course, different lifestyles and so forth promote different travel opportunities. But on average, going into that bell curve we talked about so much, um, that American citizens travel twice per year. One of them is more dedicated to holiday, first being the most important of the largest of them is Christmas and or Hanukkah, uh, followed very closely about Thanksgiving for family time, and then a little bit of a if and or between Mother's Day and Easter. Uh, that is usually the four highlights. Now, July 4th is in there as well, and don't get me wrong, but usually July 4th is more of a localized travel and not a destination distance travel. I'm not saying that's always true. Obviously, people travel to New York and D.C. for amazing fireworks, as they do with San Francisco and others, depending upon the regionality. But that's the breakdown of them. The second point of travel, which is usually the longer travel sign time, is usually dedicated in and around summer. Uh, this being because families, anybody beyond a couple, tend to travel when their kids are available from school. Anything less than school age usually means that they are very specific as to their travel capabilities because of the age of their child or children. Um, and that limits them into the choices and or distances because of just the logistics of traveling with younger children. Uh, as they grow older, you want to share experiences with them. So you tend to do more of that summer travel, family vacation travel. Just look at movies that were made like National Lampoon Vacation to give you an idea of that just going back a few years. So with that, summer is a good nexus of opportunity for most places that people are wanting to travel to. Obviously, there's a hierarchy. There are the more popular ones, and that goes down in scale. That's also how much can they finance and, and afford, which then goes down in scale. We know that that last one is having a high influence right now, which is about the ability to financially accept the burden. Now, we're seeing very quickly, we've discussed this in the show about point-of-sale transaction loans and so forth, um, that people are willing to do whatever it takes, regardless of the cost of gas, regardless of the cost of flights, regardless of the media's broadcast of the realities of travel and the challenges they're in right now. Cancellation of flights, weather delays, uh, increased costs from us as hoteliers, increased costs is up from us as restaurateurs, um, lack of rent to cars if they're needing it because of doing one of the flights. Um, whatever have you, people are still insistent that they are going to go travel. This is their chance. A lot of it has to do with what our perception is of the pandemic and, of course, our, our pent-up demand that we had. And we saw the tsunami of that last summer. We're seeing the next wave of it this summer because for those that didn't take advantage of their desire to go travel last year, they feel more comfortable this year, even given the fact that there's a residual threat of the pandemic, the severity perspective has changed a lot. So there is a very large swell of travel. We're seeing this just about everywhere. 
Uh, here in Southwest Florida, we, you know, we're looking at the fact that weather has its concerns. We have a tropical storm that's working its way through us. It'll move quickly and briefly, but it is a nice warm up to what we should be expecting for our now started hurricane season down here. We know globally there are many places, especially in the Asian Pacific region, where your typhoon season has its impact on travel. We also know that there is the upper uh, during winter time the the, the 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 winter storms that come through during winter time that has influence on. So we all have those influences in our market depending upon where we're located. What does all this bring us to? It brings us to our topic today. Our topic today is because we incessantly refer to this magic word of content. But I want to break down what we mean by content and what content really is and what it's used for based on the classification of the content that we're creating. So our topic today is how helpful is useful, the value of non-conversion content. So let's tackle a little bit of what I mean by non-conversion content. We as businesses do what we do, the best that we can do it to drive business. Our purpose is to first, I hope, satisfy our guests' interest and demands for what we have to offer. The second is to monetize that value proposition to our guests um, in a profitable way so that we can operate our business in a way that satisfies the people that invested in it, the people that work in it, and most ultimately, most importantly, the people that are taking advantage of what we have as services, guest-centric. So we provide information. Content, for lack of a better clarity of definition, is information. Now, information can come in the form of an ad, which is a solicitation for action. Offers, deals, availabilities, one chance only, FOMO offers, fear of missing outs. Uh, those are, are pieces of content that are specifically driven to incite an action. Now, uh, a lot of people make the mistake that they feel like their ad, me included at times, has to include an overabundance of information so that the decision of purchase can be made simply from the ad. And that's not the best effect of ad. An ad in its ultimate pure value is to solicit an action. Click here for more. Let follow the idea that we're presenting to a place that I can give you more information and to justify the reason I want you to be interested in what we have to talk about. So ads are solicitation of action. Um, they can't be too compact with stuff. Uh, a lot of the details are irrelevant to someone and very relevant to the other. Unfortunately, we can't make that designation as well as we'd like to, even though we've talked about tools that do that. Um, but you're always going to have a hit and miss to that. So really ads that are functioned to create action are those short-term buy now, here it is, super sale, holiday sale, whatever. Those are the things that do that. Then there is uh, content that is conversion-based content. And that is where the ad brought you. Uh, that information is about the value, definition, description, details about the offer that we made the ad for. Um, what the rules, restrictions, a value proposition, amending these inclusions, uh, all the benefits of taking advantage of what it is that we're, we're, we're selling as a benefit feature. And that is conversion content. All of that content is built to drive you to make that choice of purchase. So that is conversion content. Non-conversion content is the helpful, evergreen, general awareness. Now, there is crossover. And let me explain what that the, the crossover part is. So we went from conversion that we, we very clearly what those things are. And we can expand on that in a little bit. But the next one, which is kind of a crossover where it's helpful information, but it's not driven by a point of sale action. It's to solidify the decision of purchase, that quasi in between of this. And that is um, website content. Uh, your proximity to the things that you're featuring for the means of conversion, uh, your offering of amenities in your product so that people can identify the value of what they potentially would purchase from you. Sorry, coffee is being very good today. Um, these pieces of content are more informative, but they drive conversion. They're not non-conversion. They are helping the conversion. So that's why I say they're in a transitional point between conversion content and non-conversion content. They provide information that helps in the conversion process. And for that matter, even non-conversion content assists in that process because you're informing people. And we'll get to that. The, the information associated with your website, the detail of your product, these are 
between the purity of conversion content and the purity of non-conversion content. So now we get into the topic of today, and that is non-conversion content. Non-conversion content is evergreen content, things that you are augmenting all of this other conversion content to help identify value to what you are offering outside of just your product yourself. So let's progress thing through. We have a sales piece that we put content in about the offer itself. That's conversion content. It drives it to a website that has content about our product to reinforce what we're offering is connected to value. That is the middle ground of, of content to a place also where we start adding content associated with things that aren't about buying from us in as much as informing people of our relationship to something. Um, let's take a simple example of an event. Um, conversion content about the event is that we have an offer and a special related to the event because of our perceived value of relationship to that event. It's a tulip festival, it's a farm market, market whatever it is, it's a concert or whatever, and it, we're in proximity that makes us a value proposition as a hotel. They come to our website and our not pure con uh, conversion content talks about our location, our proximity to things, our proximity to the concert hall, perhaps. Um, things that we have that are value propositions for making the choice of staying with us in general, because of all the information that we're providing that solidifies the value proposition of the conversion content that we created. Then we slide over to non-conversion content. And that is things to do in preparation to going to the concert, best gate to go to for the lowest line. Uh, restaurants to visit before, if not ours, if we have one, um, before going into a concert. Other places that while you're in town, you don't want to miss. That content isn't about making somebody purchase from us. We know it influences it. So by all means, we're not doing this totally out of the study that we're turning into the Chamber of Commerce. But a lot of times we can fill the gaps of our value relationship to things where the Chamber of Commerce only blanket covers the value of the overall area in itself. Um, think of this in terms of like if you have a branded hotel, Hilton, IHG, Hyatt, uh, Marriott, what have you, is when you do things through the corporate marketing, they promote you in addition to everyone else in your market. Theirs is not about driving business to you directly. Theirs is about driving business to the brand that they hope that a decision is made to stay at whichever of the hotels that's under their flag in the area that that guest is interested in. That's their goal. Of course, they would be happy and will sit down at the table and tell you they would love to be able to make sure that they try to make it to your hotel. But they can't say that to you and then say it to your brand sister or brother uh, hotel in the same market. Well, they do, but um, the, the idea is that they have to be fair to everyone. They have to move the mountain for everyone. So they tend to do their marketing based on brand. Their marketing is based on brand value. We as a brand represent these hotels as options to you, the guest, and for you to determine what are the better ones. Sure, we can point out how this one's closer or this one is related to this or what have you. And of course, the brand talks to your individual hotel and says, hey, we have certain promotions and specials. If you pay more money to us to do certain things, we can make sure that you're on the top of the list compared to somewhere in the list when it comes to these events. That's how they add more money to their brand bottom line. I'm talking about how you can augment your value proposition by contributing non-conversion content in not only your website, in your messaging, in more importantly, your social media. So let's talk about how content is presented to, to our potential guests. We have pretty much three major mediums to this process. We have our, and I'm speaking, speaking about hospitality, digital marketing, hospitality marketing, but this is the online component of this. We have our presence online, which is our website. Whether we're branded or not, we have our presence online. This is who we are and this is the information about us. As we just discussed, that is not converting content, but it is conversion value content. It's that middle ground content. This is where we are, what we are. This is the value proposition we represent in our market. These are the things that make us valuable. Okay. And of course, if you have an independent hotel or more to be able to control the content on your website, you can certainly expand on content for yourself to 
broaden the interest of what you are to your market. The non-conversion content that you're creating, the awareness of events, the, hey, since you're coming between these dates and this dates, these are things that are going on in the market. Maybe you weren't aware of them, but we are, and we want to make sure you, that you are because you're going to be in town that time. Um, that kind of value proposition of adding non-converting content solidifies the value proposition of your relationship with your guest. It's not about creating a conversion. It's about sustaining the value of the conversion that's been created and or contributing to the perspective of creating a conversion. So it does help with conversion, but it's not built to be converting content. It's not like a sales ad where the points of contact of, of information in the ad are very specific to a cause of action because of the offer. It's not of data that you put in that amplifies and augments that sales offer to a page that amplifies the value of what the offer is position is. This is content, we'll call it evergreen if you would like, but that's more cyclic about perpetual value. But it's content that is helpful. It's contributing content to what you're discussing. It's adding to what the converting content has. This non-converting content is very valuable when it comes to your overall awareness and market. Not you as how you see yourself, but you as how you're seen by others. Think of it as a um, beauty con old school beauty contest. I say old school beauty contest. I don't watch them, but just, I mean, you know, new ones or anything like this because it's changed in the dynamics of what it was. Back historically, for whatever way you perceive it, there was a process that these beauty contests basically ran. You had variations of what was considered the winner of these contests. Um, a lot of it had to do with attractiveness, talent, popularity, things like this, all these mixtures of stuff. You are kind of in a beauty contest, especially when you think about your summer market. Everybody that is interested in your market is looking at you along with every other hotel in the market. And they're looking for things that are valuable to them. And we can certainly be smart about our guesses and we can certainly database our knowledge of why we want to pursue certain aspects of what makes us valuable to comparison to the others that we're being compared against. But we don't know for certainty. We can only have probability obviously, if you're going to be very attractive, then it's about what you are, your product, your, your actual uh, building and offer amenities, room types and what have you, and the rate that you're offering for it. That's that that is, you know, obviously something that is of concern for everyone. There is a commonality to that. Um, and that is. If whether you're rich and or not rich, um, you're not going to overspend based on the value of what you got, which we kind of did last summer, but that's another discussion we've had in shows past. So obviously having an attractive rate makes it interesting for people to see whether it validates that are you of that level of caliber that says, ooh, I know why they have a low rate. Look at that. And yeah, no, I don't want to stay there. That's one thing. Or wow, that's a pretty good rate for what I see there. That that the rooms look good and the reviews, you know, we'll get the reviews, sorry. You know, overall, they're, they're thinking that the value proposition of what you're asking for as a rate is reflected well in the product that you have in the sense of quality. Then you have would be somewhat the equality to being most talented, and that is how is your services? Um, what kind of services do you offer? What are your amenities? Um, do you have things on property that make it convenient and comfortable for what the person is traveling for? Like, is breakfast a part of their, their program? Is it a is it a food trough breakfast? And I don't mean to be derogatory to breakfast because I enjoy them every time I go somewhere, but there's that. And then there's the sit down breakfast that has the wonderfully prepared omelet station kind of stuff and what have you. Uh, or is it the uh, microwave eggs, <laughs> you know, and stuff. Those things have different very values for people. Obviously with a family, you're more worried about the function of breakfast than you are about the Oh, let's sit back and, and, and revel in our, our unique fresh squeeze orange juice maker machine and what have you. Value proposition to each person. So the amenities have value. And whether or not you have a spa, whether or not you have golf course, whether or not you have uh, a workout center that is worthy of being called a workout center, whether you have a variety of restaurants, whether you have a great room service, any room service, uh, all of those things add to what would be the, uh, the talents of your product. Okay. Then there's the most popular award, which would be about your review scores. Um, how influencers, people that have great followings related to the context of your location and or services, how do they feel about you? And then more importantly, 
is your CRM relationships with your past guests and your future guests and who they talk to that expands your guest roster because when they went back, they had such a wonderful time. They became advocates of you and shared their joy of coming back again to you or if they ever do make it back to the market to stay with you again because they appreciated what they had when they were with you, that word of mouth. So the most popular value of it is your review scores, how people rate you for those that go to the platforms that they do that with. And the influencers that are in the space, whether professionally, semi-professionally, prosumerly, whatever, as to how they perceive you from their perspective with the audiences that they have. And then there's the word of mouth of those people that uh, are advocates of you, the advocacy program. Then you have what's called besting contest. And that really comes from rankings, ratings, and featured placements. How well does Google see you? Do they see you as the most authoritative for what it is that people are looking for to your market so that they organically place you on top. That organic placement is incredibly valuable, but are you also augmenting that organic placement with all the things that have pushed that result down, which is all of the paid placements and the Google stuff that they put in, the maps and the, the helpful you know hotel finders and so forth that immediately compare your product by price and availability, because if you don't have availability for the dates that are popping automatically in the windows, they're not going to really show you in the rankings, even though you're paying budget to be showing up. Those dates don't show well because you don't have inventory, which is a control function of MetaSearch. Um, and also whether you have ad placement. We called it a trifecta perspective way back years ago, where they would see you on organic, they would see you in the maps, and they would see you in the ads. And so because of that, they felt that you were authentically interesting because you showed up so predominantly on what they were searching for. That trifecta is why we keep telling ownerships, why do you advertise when um, for your own name when you should be showing up for your own name? It's true. But with all the metrics that Google and Bing use to identify what they think is the most relevant results to the person searching, they know so much about that individual searching that they've learned that maybe your brand and or your price rate and or the fact it doesn't have an amenity or the fact that you don't show up for what they were initially looking for before makes a less relevant position for you so that you don't show up as often as you would do considering all the time being 100% voice because you're not as relevant to that particular search person's search query okay, than you are to others in their search query. And it's really hard to explain that to owners and so forth that even though you're amazingly well optimized, that someplace like a TripAdvisor, someplace like an Expedia can actually organically show up better for you because in addition to the content that you have for yourself, they have that plus what others have said about you, plus what others have said have around you, plus your relevancy to what they're looking for based on how they searched for it. They have so many stacked things that add to their value proposition of organically showing up better than you that you don't. And ownership's like, well, that's me. Why am I not number one? Because you're not number one from all the things you can be for all the things that are used in these tools. It's it's hard to conceive in some person's circumstances for this as to why that would not be the case. You know, you're looking for my hotel by name. Why shouldn't I be the top on that list? Because there's people that have more about you. Um, and that's not something you can actually fix overall. That's why we have to ride on the coattails of other platforms. Um, that's why sometimes you do have to advertise in OTAs because they are spending the money in places you would never, even if you wanted to, because of the amount of money necessary to spend, to be that far away from this conversion value that we often give ourselves. Content, going back to our topic, has these three categories. They have the conversion content, which is mainly ad-based and, and supportive content to the ad. There's the middle ground you know, between the two, which is the content that is available to solidify the perspective of the product as it relates to the conversion content. And then you have the non-conversion content, which was our focal of today, which is content that helps in general with the guest experience, helping inadvertently, indirectly, I should say not inadvertently, indirectly, the conversion decision they might be facing because of the additional content that we're sharing that isn't about buy now, click here, get this, offer, offer, offer. It's more about here's some cool information that would be helpful for you. Here's some information that you may not be aware of when you have to already chosen to stay with us. See, we push so hard to make that conversion. And then it's kind of like we walk away from it. Like, okay, now we got them. Boom, next one, notch on the belt. Let's keep going. And actually, that's when the journey of reaffirmation of conversion turns into be the most important. Once you've gotten that conversion, 
you need to solidify that relationship persistently because up until the time they show up at your front desk, based on cancellation policies, based on other opportunities that other competitors can push, they can see other alternatives as they get off the plane, if they flew in, that they might choose to do. And that may be because they're more rate-based than we want to give them credit or just because someplace undercut us. And I do this on a marketing sense all the time. I'll give you an example of this. If, if somebody picked a hotel and they're going to stay at it and we're competing with that hotel, we would geofence the airport. And what that would mean is that anybody within the confines of the radius that we created, if they use certain keywords, okay, in their uh, searches, okay, uh, in some instances we did it about cancellations or being stranded or what have you, that's one side of it. The other side of it was best rate, um, best rate nearby, best hotel nearby. If we popped up and offered what we knew was a competitively lower rate than our comp set, we had the chance and were successful at it in literally making somebody walk from the direction they were going to the, our competitor's hotel to hang a left, so to speak, and come to our hotel because at the very last moment, we were able to convince them that we offered not only a better rate, but our product was all the things that you were probably buying the other product for, but cheaper. That's a rate-driven strategy, first off. Secondly, it's very aggressive and it can be done only when you know you have peak travel like that and you know you already have existing search queries that are relevant num numerically in that market to justify that kind of campaign. You can't think that one or two people out of the airport are looking like this because it's not worth it. First off, Google won't let you do it. Secondly, it would be way expensive even if you had minimalist numbers to it. It has to be substituted enough to justify the efforts, the targeting, and the strategy. Plus, there is always the influx of comparison between you and other properties that works out in your local life because you're laying the groundwork of, oh, so that how it is. And now you've created an upscale competitive relationship with most of your in-market competitors. So anyway, going back to content as a value proposition, these are also, in keeping the context of competitors, a defining difference between you and another hotel. If, and just try this yourself, if you haven't already experienced this yourself, when you're looking at hotels that you're interested in going and you see one hotel that seems like a very good rate and another hotel that seems marginally the same rate, but when you look at the properties, you see a difference in quality or you look at the properties, you see a difference in review or perception of people of the property. If you look at both properties, you see different representations of the property that one isn't really easy to discover, but the other one is more predominantly well discovered and well reviewed and well perceived and looks like it has all the amenities and maybe in a few extra and others. And the prices, even though they're not matched, is only slightly different. You might lean to the side that has the better value and or you know better, better amenities, better service and so forth, even though it may not have the best value because it looks like you're going to have a more enjoyable experience compared to the other one that may have lesser rankings by comparison. That's the value of non-converting content. Making this content is about for the purpose of why it is being made. And I say this for a few reasons. Let's go through the three types of content again. Conversion content has a pure purpose, and that is to drive action and then support that action with relevant information. That's a pretty much straight up no brainer for this. You're not looking to index it for searchability. You're looking at there for effect of content value, what it's being read and seen as videos, images, whatever. And those are all pieces of content. Remember, rich media, media, text, okay? Uh, all of those are totally to drive the relevancy of the action request. Come here, good. Now that you're here, let's fully value what it is we brought you here for. Please make a purchase decision. That's converting content, conversion content. Then you have the content on your website, which is affirmational about who you are, how people see you, what you're offering, the, the expansion of content about the visualization of your brain. Maybe these are where you do your tours, you do your images, you do your review listings, you do your amenity listings, your detail to amenities listings, people feedback them about amenities. You amplify all the things that people would be interested in you by being more detailed about. Not amplify as in make cotton candy stuff up, amplify it as into augmenting all the things that people perceive you are historically so that for those that are similar to those same people, the lookalike audiences we talk about so often, they see it in the same positive light of those that experienced it, okay? And then you have the non-conversion content. And this content is written 
okay, sorry, I skipped past the point. The the interim content of the websites we just talked about, uh, that has to be optimized. That has to be searched. So a lot of your referencing to not just creating an action of purchase has to be making sure that you're using terms, vernacular, and repetitions related to what you are in such a way that the search engines, Google and Bing and so forth, index you with authority on that. You truly do have a spa that is a spa, not a wannabe spa. Spa. You have a fitness room that's truly a fitness room and not a place that has loose weights and lucky if they were even loose. You know, you validate it by all of those things that Google and Bing look for. So that content has to be optimized for SEO. The non-conversion content truly has to be written in a way that is helpful to the guest first Optimize for discovery second. And why do I say that? Because what you're putting out as content for non-conversion content for the for, for people is about user engagement. It's a lot about putting it on social. It's a lot about augmenting pages on your website that refer to events and things like this that are not about necessarily buying a rate as it is letting you know that our value proposition is, is related to this by offering all the information about an event. Some place in New York would not be talking about a someplace of an event in San Francisco because of the lack of relevance. You can say, well, I can fly from New York to San Francisco, but it's not relevant to that hotel. It's not a benefit relationship to that hotel. So the content inherently by writing it, non-conversion content, in your context of your website for your hotel means that you find that there's a relevance to this information to what you offer as services. People are not dumb. They understand why you're talking about it because you feel that you have a relationship to the possibility of what that uh, non-conversion content is. Now, the non-conversion content being guest-centric means that you're trying to satisfy their interest once they've come to you. Optimizing it just simply means that you had, have the chance of showing up in it when people are looking for the event first and discover that you're relevant to it. That is a harder one to do because the content that you create, the videos, the photography, the, the text more particularly, um, you're fighting a larger audience of places that are much better at it. That's when your chambers, your CVBs, your event-driven websites are better suited for that content. They have a higher authority in the eyes of Google and Bing, and you are an upstart. Yes, you have content, but you're not as authoritative in that content as they are. So you're not going to rank and show well. This is when you can make the happy decision that you have that content to augment people on your website knowing that you are related to this, but you're not trying to be the authority to be discovered because of it. It is important in social because you have a progressive storyline that you do in social. We've had this discussion in the live, so over all the years we've ever done this. Social is an amplifier to all your other converting platforms. It is a place that you put content through dialogue and story that is a progressive story. And this is calculated backwards in time from what it is you're writing about. If it is an event-driven content, uh, uh, content piece, then you look at the event date. You go backwards to your optimum booking window. You go backwards to your discovery window or your education window, and you go backwards to your discovery window. That discovery and education frame is where you interject your social content. You listen and learn what groups and what hashtags are related to the event. You listen to those first to see what it is people are looking to discover more or validate or find interesting. And you see whether you're relevant to those topics. And you begin to contribute content based on those hashtags, based on those mediums in which they're talking, whether it be Facebook or not, on your, the same social platform like Facebook or Twitter, if you're that heavily into it, uh, Instagram and what have you, so that you begin to offer value on first-person perspective of things that people should be mindful of. Like, you're not saying, hey, I'm a hotel, stay with me, by the way, we know information about what the best gate to go through. That's, pit, that's that bait and switch. It's more of like, hey, look, we love this concert. We've gone to this concert many times. We know that gate five is really the best one when it comes to lack of lines. Uh, we'll keep posting other information to be, you know, what, that we think can help the group understand to make their plans. And you begin the storyline and not about whether or not you have rates and dates, not about whether you have specials or deals. It's about guest centric focused, non-conversion content. Here's some helpful pictures that we had from last year. Here's some helpful things that we discovered. Here's a restaurant that if you want to make sure you have uh, the most convenient place to eat when you come out of the concert, make a reservation now here. Here's their information. That kind of helpful stuff 
makes it where you're in the dialogue. People are like, oh, these, this, this hotel's pretty cool. They're really being helpful. I wonder what, you know, this, obviously they're being participants of this because it, they get business from this. Let me go look at them. Maybe this is someplace I want to stay. That's what you're hoping from doing on conversion content. So you know what it, 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 it affects it. Now, once you get closer to your prime booking window and people are past the di discovery and education phases, your content can begin to refer to conversion-based content. Hey, if you want to know more about what we're offering during this event, here's a link to uh, our page about that. And then that link goes to a page that is about conversion content. What do we offer? What do you get included? What are the benefits of it? Here's an action focus position to book, click the button to buy it. That's conversion content. So that's how you develop the types of content based on the segmentations of the content. Um, again, it is very much like an old school beauty contest. You have most attractive, which is about your product and your rates, most talented, which is about your amenities and services, most popular, which is about your review scores, influencers, and word of mouth uh, advocates. And your best in contest, your rankings, your ratings, your featured placements, your presence when people see and look for you, that you're all over the place and that people are talking about you and so forth, validate that you're the best of the contest. And that keeps you away from being, you know, the Miss Congeniality Award, which is you're pleasant and nice, but you didn't win an award. I know the analogies because I'm, I'm notorious for them. I wouldn't say famous. I'm notorious for them. It just came to my mind about all of this because you have this question mark that pops in people's heads. And I've seen this so many times with clients and ownerships and so forth. We refer to the word content and it gets batted around in context that it shouldn't be in uh, because it is too broad of a statement that can be implied for anything. But really, if you go forward in conversations, know that you have fundamentally three segments. You have converting content, which is ad related. You have transitional com uh, content, which is influencing conversion content, but more for information relationship. And then you have non-converting content, which is more about augmentation and amplification of the other two. And that's really it. And you have three variations of content you can create. You can create videos, uh, you can create images, and you create text. And combinations of those relate to converting content, which is ads, image videos, and uh, or, or just text only. Um, or transitional uh, content, which can include pictures of, of things that are supportive of the content and or images and or videos, whatever. And then you have non-converting content, which also can just have helpful videos, images, and uh, text content related to information that you're trying to share in, in the medium that you're sharing it and be Facebook, Twitter, or on your website for just general content. And there you have it. So Again, our topic today uh, for the show was how helpful is useful, the value of non-conversion content. And the intent, of course, was non-conversion content is useful and it drives helpfulness, but in the way that is not just conversion driven. So I think that brings us to a nice uh, spot, keeping with just the topic to this. Uh, I would be mindful to remind you of some things that are coming up. Uh, for those in our Asian community, APAC community, Asian Pacific region, uh, HSMI Asia uh, Pacific is doing a uh, our ROC Revenue Optimization Conference in Singapore next week, starting on the 9th. Um, they are doing it in two types. There is the in-person, which is always so beneficial because you get the ability to interact and dialogue uh, unstiltedly uh, with people and get to see vendors firsthand and face-to-face -face and go through the discovery process with them, which is infinitely more valuable when it comes to conference attendance. And then they're also doing an online uh, representation that at this point, I don't believe all of the presentations will be live. I think they might try to do a couple of them, uh, but they're gonna record everything and then make it available later on as well. So there'll be that opportunity that if you can't find it, and it, it's not just finances, but we're finding out what we're learning from all of these things, all of us around the world. Conferences have a component to them that are still influenced by, um, legalities as to how you're brought in, how you're not brought in, whether you have to go through testing, not testing, quarantine, not quarantining. Um, there's also the validation threshold of the finances to going to conferences. We talked about this at great lengths uh, in show 354, 354 on uh, the breakdown of conferences and the decision process of conferences between being an attendee, being a presenter and being a vendor. Uh, we went through that in great detail as to the price values and the numerics associated with the decision process. We're not going to rehash that. You can go back to the show and watch that. Um, but it's the idea that 
with the region that they're having the conference in, some countries still have restrictions and requirements about traveling to and from. And so because of that, that has to be augmented into the, the decision process of being able to physically be able to attend the conference. That's whole one whole thing. Then the other whole thing is we are still dealing with a massive manpower shortage in our industry. And because of that, those that are working diligently in our industry are working their butt duties off. And they just don't have the luxury of the time away to go to a conference. And as much as how helpful it will be, how great the content is, like this HSMA APAC one is, um, they don't have the opportunity to actually go. And of course, the third threshold is just the finances, you know, with everything being as expensive as it has grown to and supply chain issues still existing, inflation is still existing and cost of travel and accommodations and everything else as high as it is. There's the financial thing of, well, unless we can really truly define the value proposition we're getting from the conference in a tangible value return way and not just edification and clarification and education, which has its own values, um, then let's not. Well, that's why the APAC has decided smartly to offer an online version of their content so that that breaks down that excuse. Like, okay, so you can't make it in person, which is ultimately the best, but not to lose the value of the content that was presented. Here's a way of getting that content. So by all means, take a look at that. Um, uh, I'll put the show links and the links to the conference uh, and, and in with the show links about it, uh, all the ways that you can connect to and sign up for it. And no matter where you are in the world, the content and presentations are phenomenal. The speakers are excellent. And the value of being able to watch that and whatever form you can make it is highly, highly worth it. That being said, there's also HSMA North America that is running their revenue optimization conference at the end of the month in Orlando, Florida, just a few hours north of me. And I'll be going up there covering it live on our TV channel. Oh, by the way, we haven't worked out the details yet, but HSMA APAC, we're trying to arrange it so that we can get either a keynote or uh, entry introduction to the conference or whatever broadcast it on the TV channel. So we get to share and show uh, the startup of the Singapore revenue optimization conference uh, next week. We're working on the details on that. Keep an eye on the, cha the channel for that because it will be on the free side. We're not going to charge people to go see this. We want people to be excited about it rolling out and being be able to see uh, a truly excellent conference in Singapore uh, relevant to revenue management. That being said, uh, HSMA in North America will be doing the Revenue Opposition Conference in, and also Marketing Conference, uh, both of those in collusion with high tech. For those unfamiliar with high tech, Hospitality Industry Technology uh, uh, Conference, it is um, the place to go to for emerging technologies. It used to be a lot about, you know, bed technology and housekeeping technology and engineering technology. And it's not that those aren't there, but now a lot of uh, software systems, PMS systems, POS systems, a lot of technology at that side, plus, you know, robots and cool stuff like that are all there as well. So I'll be going up to that to cover it live uh, on our TV channel, Hospitality Channel. For those that don't watch us on TV, please go there and get the channel. It's free to watch the show. It'll be free to watch the uh, coverage of the conferences. Uh, you can certainly go to that. I'll put more links into all of it. You can see it on uh, the web at talktravel.tv. Um, you'll be able to, uh, uh, with the app, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, whether iOS or Android, you can watch it by just downloading the app, Hospitality Channel. You'll be able to see it on your phone or tablet or whatever for that, computer if you like. Uh, and of course, on TV, on Roku, Apple, Google, and Amazon, you can watch us. Just look for the Hospitality Channel. You'll be able to see us cover the rock and marketing conferences at the end of this month with uh, HSMA North America. And I think with what's going on with uh, EU, uh, we'll be probably doing the same thing for them when they roll into theirs. Uh, they're going through their educational series now. So we'll be talking to uh, Inga then and uh, ask her about uh, getting connected to broadcast some of that stuff as well. So with all that in mind, thank you as always for the privilege of your time. Um, my name is Lauren Gray, and I look forward to talking to you. Oh, don't forget our podcast today. Sorry, don't mean to interrupt myself again. Um, we always do our podcast at the end of this show. We do an audio podcast. I've been doing it for 17 years, actually. Um, and we'll be recapping this show, but also having some pretty cool tools about functionality of content generation. So you might want to go over and catch that one as well. And it talks about specific tools and specific modalities of creating content. There's a lot of really cool, innovative tools that are coming up about content creation. And we're going to cover some of those today. So again, thank you for the privilege of your time. My name is Long Gray. Look forward to talking to you all next week on show number 357. Until then, take care.